Good evening. My name is Taukie Kitao, president of the Brisbane Tuvalu community and the community committee member of the Pacific Island Council for Queensland. On behalf of Friends of the Earth, Climate Frontline Program and Pacific Island Council for Queensland, I welcome everyone to our second online forum on climate change challenges to sovereignty of our Pacific Atoll Nation. Firstly, I would like to acknowledge the indigenous owners and sovereign peoples of this land, the Turubu and Yagara people, on whose land which we are hosting this online forum. I pay my respects to the leaders, elders, past, present, and emerging. Now we ask for their blessing and their wisdom that they continue, we continue to respect and they are the first people of this land we are gathered upon. As is culturally important to our Pacific way, I would like us to take this time to open our forum in prayer. Now let us pray. Thank you, our Heavenly Father, for giving us this great opportunity to be able to gather here on this online platform to get to again deliberate and engage in discussion on the important important topic of today we are actually father to bless us and give us the, the knowledge courage and wisdom to deliberate and share our experiences and indigenous knowledge on issues of concern to our small island nations. We begin our session today in your grace and we ask you to end it in good spirit and encouragement so that we can continue to be strong in our efforts to raise awareness on issues of concern to our small island states and our Pacific region as a whole. We ask you all, all this in your name. Amen. Now I now take this, this time to welcome our guest speakers and our panelists this evening. In Tuvalu, I say talofa and welcome to our guest speakers and panelists, Reverend James Bagwan from the Pacific Conference of Churches, Associate Professor Katerina Dewa from the Australian Association for Pacific Studies at the Australian National University, and Mr. Mai Natalia, who is the Tuvalu Climate Action Network Secretary. Thank you for accepting our invitation and willingness to share your experiences on this sensitive topic. Now, we all know that Pacific Islanders are fighting against climate change as a direct threat to our land and our ocean. But how many of us realize that climate change means that we must also fight for our political independence and our identity. This is our sovereignty. We cannot let it be taken from us, even if our land is highly at risk. In Tuvalu, where I'm from, we we fought hard to be an independent nation, to be independent from Britain and Kiribati. We did this because we did not want our unique Tuvaluan culture to be dominated by others. And also we wanted to make our own decisions because we know what is best for our culture and our people. This online forum discussions or Talanoa sets the platform for the face-to-face -face conference, which will encourage participants to engage in a deep interaction and discussions with a vision for an outcome that will benefit policy decisions and influence legal boundaries in the Pacific and in the international space. We, Pacific Island, Pacific small island states, cannot and will not allow climate change to take away our sovereign rights to our lands, our values, customs, and ocean space. Now this evening, 
we will hear from we will hear from perspective from the church, the academia, and community on the challenges of sovereignty in Atoll Island nations. I now introduce this evening's uh, moderators, Stella Miria Robinson from PNG, who is an advocate for climate change in our Pacific communities. She is a member of the Friends of the Earth Brisbane Climate Frontlines and also is a past president of the Pacific Island Council of Queensland. Co-moderating with Stella is Tate Mayan Wickham from Kiribati, the secretary for the Pacific Island Council for Queensland, and also the vice president for the Queensland Kiribati community. Thank you, Stella and Tate. Thank you very much for the introduction, um, Taupie. And I would also like to welcome all our speakers and our audience from all your various locations and spaces from which you are joining us today. Welcome. I would like to add a little bit more about myself that um, TK did not have the opportunity to share with you. Uh, my family originates from Ulalan in the Kairuka district of Papua, uh, central province of Papua New Guinea. I come from a line of navigators and skip, skippers and warriors and also great gardeners. So that's a little bit of my heritage. But what a great privilege and honor for me to be here today in an event that supports the Pacific Islands Council of Queensland, as well as our Friends of the Earth, uh, Australia, Brisbane Climate Frontlines, which um, have been working in collaboration. Now, I need to mention that the Pacific Islands Council has a commitment to the development of our young Pacifica people in our Queensland diaspora, and it is therefore with pride I would like to uh, introduce Tate to you, who will introduce herself in our island way. Thank you. Thank you, Asisala. I'm a better Maori. My name is Tate Mei Wickham. I'm the daughter of Dr. Tatawa, the late Dr. Tatawa Karakawa Mei, and my mother is Dr. Erika Jeffrey. From my father's side, I'm from the islands of Kuria, Abemame, Aranuka, and Abeyan. From my mother's side, I'm from the Bedoya, Renos, Marage, and Abeyan. I am honored again to be with you here today and welcome again to our second forum on the topic of climate change and sovereignty to the Pacific, to the past Pacific Atoll nations. We are really honored to be here, to be here with you both all, all tonight and just to facilitate, co facilitate tonight with Auntie Stella. It was an honor. So, for those members of our audience who um, did participate in the first forum, you will know that our speakers from that session were from eminent and prominent um, uh, groups of a strong Pacific climate change leadership and advocacy team who have been heralding warnings about the impact of climate change for the Blue Pacific at the international level for many, many years. Today, however, our focus is on what sovereignty means for our communities, um, our identities and our cultures, and hopefully there will be an appreciation of what is happening on the ground in our small atoll nations. Today's forum will follow a slightly different format to our first forum because um, Tata and I will be introducing our speakers, um, you know, for them to give a little bit of a, a, a brief around, you know, what their specialty is um, and following their presentations, we will be following with a, a session, um, a Q&A session, yeah. yeah, session on some of the questions that have come out of the first forum. So we're looking forward to that because we're really wanting to see what the uh, today's speakers, what their perceptions are going to be in relation to those questions. Following that, however, there will be another uh, Q&A se session, but focusing more on your questions, you, the listeners today, and you know, um, following that, however, we will then go to closing. But 
for now. Um, it gives me great pleasure, it honestly does, gives me great pleasure to introduce our first speaker for this evening. For, th for those of you who don't know, my Natalia of Vaitu Vaitupu Tuvalu, he has naturally a very long history of involvement and familiarity with the climate change agenda. Now, this involvement has been reflected in his work with the Tuvalu Climate Action Network, or TUCAN, which he is currently working with still, and that's from when he joined them in 2011. There's your level of commitment. Also, at the international level, um, Mana has been included in the Indigenous Peoples Platform, um, where the focus has been, you know, on our global Indigenous people under the UNFCCC's local communities and Indigenous oh, and Indigenous Peoples Platform. Okay, now Mana is presently a doctorate candidate with the Charles Sturt University in Sydney from where he is joining us today. And we look forward to perhaps catching some aspects of his work that he's doing on his thesis for this forum, but also just to see what he's got to say. So thank you so much, uh, Mina, for being with us today. Thank you. I hand over to you. Sorry, can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Okay, thank you so very much for that very long introduction. And uh, uh, well, basically, first of all, uh, let us applaud the uh, Wallabies for defeating the uh, All Blacks <laughs> over the <laughs> weekend. Um, my reflection is basically on the, um, some set of questions that were raised by your committee. I will try to respond in order to reflect some of them. But I would love to engage further in our discussion later on. Well, there must be, uh, when, when we talk about um, identity and sovereignty, migration and relocation, it's very sensitive to all of us, especially those from low-lying atolls. But well, there, there, there must be a place where you can identify yourself with. It makes no sense to say that I am from Tuvalu without making any reference to its uh, geographical location. This is the reason why we continue to advocate for climate justice. In the Pacific, land identifies who we are as people and as a community. Land, Fanua, Fenua, Vanua, it's where our culture and our language and our communal values are rooted. Thus, the logic is very simple. If we continue to protect our land from submerging, we are literally protecting our identity, who we are and what makes us Tuvaluans or as Pacific Islanders. If we lose our land to the sea, we are simply losing life and our identity. We must not send a wrong and confused signal to the international community. Maintaining our call for climate justice is important. Migration must not and should not be a solution. I strongly believe that migration is absolutely and absolutely premature and morally incorrect at this point in time. It should not be an option. It should not be a solution. But sorry, it should, it should not be a, a solution, but it must be a option for, for others who wish to, to migrate or to move. Because we owe a moral obligation to our people, our communities who do not have the opportunity like us to access various platforms to raise their case. Therefore, it is our call to speak on, on their behalf. It is our duty to care for our Muno de Fale, our indigenous wisdom and practices that existed long before Christianity and the Palangi civilization. So when it comes to the issue of sovereignty, 
For us indigenous peoples, sovereignty is simply the absence of any foreign domination. From an indigenous view, our sovereignty is the liberty to do what we think is right in our social and cultural context. It does not need any approval from any state or government. Our sovereign rights to exist as people is not determined by any form of declaration nor convention that the West think it's, it is appropriate for us. No, given that we all live in communal settings, our sovereignty consists of our sovereign, of our indigenous spirituality, our culture, our language, social economics and political systems, and our relationship with nature. It is our environment, our surrounding, our landscape, seascape, airscape, how we freely manage our umanga, the cultivation of land, the management of our fruits, the wanyu, and the moana, utilizing muno de fale. So it is very important that we go back to our traditional knowledge, traditional wisdom, and understand what is best and what is ought to be done to ensure the continuity of our people and our communities. I will stop there for now, and I look forward to engaging further questions if there are uh, need to be, to be answered. Thank you. Thank you very thank much, you. Mana. Great way to start. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you for that. Yes, thank you. And we also uh, note that uh, Reverend James Bagwan has, has been Joined able us. to log in with us. Welcome. And um, yes, no, thank you. That was a great, that was a great beginning and interesting start for tonight's uh, uh, Q&A sessions to follow. I'm sure we'll have a lot of questions and, and um, notes to follow up on that. But to go on to quickly to our second speaker, Conscious of Time, we also have, okay, so um, I would like to briefly introduce Katerina Tewa as our second speaker. So Katerina is of Banabin and Gilibas, an African-American heritage, born and raised in Fiji. She was the founder and convener for the Pacific Studies teaching program at ANU. Katerina's commentary on the Pacific, sorry, <laughs> Katerina's commentary on Pacific issues have been published in The Conversation, Sydney Morning Herald, The Guardian, ABC Drum, Foreign Affairs, and Australian Outlook. In 2019, she was awarded the College of Asia and Pacific Teaching Excellence Award. Here to bring the Pacific research and academia perspective to conversation and of climate change is Katerina Tewa. Welcome. I'm the Maori, everyone, and Nisambula Vinaka. I'm coming to you from Nunawal and Nambri country here in Canberra, the wonderful Canberra. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm so honored to have been invited to participate in this forum. It's quite exciting to be in a space with Ikiribas and Tuvaluans and all the amazing uh, people gathered here, but representation from the Central Pacific is not something we often get to do here in Canberra. So um, it's wonderful to meet you all and to be having this Talanoa with you. Um, now, while I have um, written about climate change in the various um, journals and forums that you've mentioned, um, I think my research about Banaba in Kiribati and the displacement of Banabans from Kiribati to Fiji is probably quite relevant to what we're discussing today. So as mentioned, um, I'm of Banaban and Ikiribati heritage. Um, from Banaba, I am from Tabiang and Tabuewa village. And um, I'm also Ikiribati from Tabitewea, from Tabitewea North. Um, with uh, uh, my grandparents are uh, from Eita and Usiroa village. Mm. So Banaba um, has a very um, interesting and often controversial history in the context of the transition from the Gilbert and Ellis Islands to the Republic of uh, Kiribati. And um, as Mina mentioned earlier, um, Banabans had the same thoughts as Tuvaluans did uh, when it came to decisions about 
um, independence. So what I think is relevant uh, for me to really briefly touch on today, just in the opening part of the discussion, is the, is the issue of the impact of human-induced environmental devastation on sovereignty, on heritage, on identity, and on displacement. Because in many ways, the Banabans have already gone through what people are imagining may happen to um, Pacific Islanders, particularly from low-lying atolls, um, happening to them in the future because of climate change. And so what I regularly um, argue is that we need to be thinking about and learning from Pacific peoples who have already been displaced uh, within the Pacific, especially um, in between countries in the Pacific and learn from what's happened to them, what decisions were made and what that displacement, um, how that displacement affected their sense of self-determination and sovereignty because in many ways the Banabans um, were moved not with uh, much choice and they were moved because their island was devastated by phosphate mining. Phosphate mining is very much part of um, the impact of industrialization on the whole planet. So it's not separate from climate change. It's not a separate issue. Climate change um, is, a, is a systemic issue that arises out of the ways in which humans have treated the planet as a resource for extraction in order to fuel their consumption. And Banaba and what happened on Banaba with the phosphate mining is very much part of that story part of that narrative, part of that history of colonialism, imperialism, resource extraction, um, transformation of the environment and making the environment unlivable for people. So um, even though Banaba is quite a small island there in the center uh, of the Pacific, and I have a, a map that perhaps we can share at this stage just to give people a sense of where it is um, located, uh, especially where it's located with respect to Australia and New Zealand. Um, this tiny part of the Pacific, though, uh, made a huge contribution to agriculture in Australia and New Zealand, and also globally through the British Empire. So that extraction of phosphate from people's lands, people's villages, meant that they could no longer live on their lands. And as Mina mentioned, Tiapa is everything to Banabans and to Ikiriba. So when you take people's lands, you take their heritage, you take their identity. So in our case, it was mined, it was removed, and it was spread over the fields of um, Australia and New Zealand to grow um, the agricultural industries uh, through uh, fertilizer. So what can we learn from this history when thinking about the future? Um, Banabans are not the only people who've been displaced in the Pacific, but their story is a microcosm. Um, it's a case study for what happens when you take away land, when you take away sovereignty and when you take away uh, or when you try to take away people's heritage and identity because when Banabans were moved from um, their homeland to Fiji in 1945 and I should mention this year is the 75th anniversary of that displacement um, uh, to Rambi Island in Fiji uh, they had to rebuild their culture and did it in many different ways that were quite challenging. So when we think about what might happen to our children and our grandchildren and this potential for being removed and displaced, it's really interesting to learn from the Banaban experience because um, it wasn't easy at all. Even being displaced within the Pacific from one Pacific country to another Pacific country uh, had took a huge toll 
on the Bonobans, especially coming out of World War II. So my research is about that. It's about the displacement of people because of the impact of mining on their environment. Um, but it's also about the ways in which what people imagine as small, insignificant islands in the Pacific, the way in which those so-called small, insignificant islands actually contribute a huge amount to the economic development, and in this case, agricultural development of much bigger, far more prosperous countries. So there is a sense of economic injustice there, not only environmental injustice, but economic injustice in terms of the flows of resources and wealth going to other countries, but not so much to the people whose lands were mined out. So all of these issues are also relevant when thinking about climate change, because Pacific Islanders contribute very little <laughs> to the problem, to the global problem of fossil fuel emissions, but are impacted significantly. And the Banaban story is, is a microcosm of similar effects. Um, so that's my research. And whenever I talk about climate change in, in various forums, I bring it up as an example of how we can learn from the past when thinking about future policies in terms of what's going to happen to our people because of the situation we're facing today. Vinaka. Um, would you like to go on to? Yes. Um, yeah. Reverend James Bhagwan, thank you very, very much for joining us. We got a little bit anxious about whether you would be able to join us and we're so happy that you are with us today. So thank you. Um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce you. So um, my understanding, Reverend James, is that you're a Fijian Methodist minister of mixed heritage, both Indian and Itaoke with roots in Viti Levu and Vanua Levu. Um, Reverend James, for everybody's uh, information, is a general secretary of the Pacific um, Council of Churches. It's a huge ecumenical peak body in the Pacific with 31 member churches and nine national councils of churches across the region. Our churches are steeped in our communities. So we're really looking forward to hearing what Reverend James has to share with us around his thoughts on sovereignty. Thank you, Reverend. Thank you very much for um, the opportunity to uh, join you in this uh, conversation. Um, I'm happy that I'm after Katerina because the uh, picture in my background is uh, Ramby Island. Um, of course, it was accidental that I picked this picture, <laughs> but it was from a, uh, from a, a visit um, uh, about five years ago. And um, I've just recently returned um, from um, a community in Fiji, the uh, village of Narikoso on the island of Ono in the Kandavu group, uh, just south of the capital city of Suva, um, which is uh, one of our um, uh, communities here in Fiji, coastal uh, island communities that is in the process of being relocated as a result of climate-induced displacement. Um, it was part of a uh, solidarity trip and uh, also to see how we can uh, support the work of, uh, well, how we can support our sisters and brothers in Narikoso um, as the church, but also in practical ways um, in, in this uh, challenging time that they're facing of uh, forced relocation. I think um, I'll begin by saying that uh, in the issue of sovereignty, the Pacific Conference of Churches has been, uh, um, since its establishment in 1961, uh, been heavily involved in the issues of sovereignty, particularly around self-determination. And uh, it's important to note uh, that as we are talking about uh, sovereignty in the context of climate change, we still have a number of Pacific Island territories, Pacific Island uh, uh, communities that are still under foreign domination. We have uh, West Papua, which uh, many of you are aware of. We have uh, Kanaki that just went through uh, a very narrow uh, second referendum for independence and we'll have another one in two years. And we have Mauhinui, or French uh, occupied Polynesia, which uh, 
is really uh, we can see the impact of colonialization on um, that particular um, uh, Pacific Island community to this day as the site of nuclear testing. And uh, uh, with uh, officially 9,995 positive COVID-19 cases because the French government um, insists on uh, allowing tourists and travelers into the country. Um, so it's important when we talk about uh, sovereignty that uh, we're talking about these issues as well, because these are the challenges that we will find our communities uh, facing. Uh, uh, Maina, uh, in his um, background on the issue of sovereignty, has really spoken about things that we find very important at PCC, and it's uh, uh, Maina is an important colleague um, for us in our work, uh, not only with uh, um, the Tuvalu uh, Climate Action Network, but also in his uh, strong uh, uh, involvement and influence with the uh, church in Tuvalu, uh, which, we, which we have as a member of PCC. And um, we, we have been discussing the challenges around um, this option that, that, um, that Maina has been talking about, that we don't want climate-induced relocation or migration, as some people call it, to be a, uh, a solution. But how do we go around preparing for it as, as an option that we keep in the back pocket when everything else fails? Um, you know, as Pacific Islanders, one of our important uh, things we, we are reminded when we are growing up, especially if we're by the sea, is to always keep our eye on the horizon, look ahead of the wave, um, and be prepared for what is coming. And so um, we've been having uh, discussions and work on the issue of climate-induced migration um, and the impacts that that will have. And uh, Katharina gave a very good example from Rambi um, about the issue of, of, of uh, forced relocation. Um, Tuvalu has also a, a sister island in Fiji, Kiowa, which had a different kind of relocation, a more organized relocation, very different from the context of, uh, of Rambi. Um, and so we have a number of different areas when we start to look at this issue. We have what happens with the issue of relocation in our own countries when it's internal relocation? And who decides um, what those procedures will be? Um, are they just straight government policies that are adopted uh, wholesale from uh, some uh, funding agency or a, 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 a country partner who said, okay, we'll do a project on this? Um, does it take into account not only the practical uh, aspects um, of, of the relocation, but does it take into account the social impacts? Does it take into account the issue of dignity? Um, of, of people, when uh, does it take into account the issue of security? When people are relocated from coastal areas further inland, um, the issue of security for, for, for example, the women who have to come further down to the coast to do their fishing and will now not just be able to go on their own but have to make sure that they go in groups. Um, the consideration of, of all the needs of the community, including the elderly, including the disabled, when decisions are being made. And perhaps most importantly for us in the Pacific, does it take into account our, our spirituality? And when I talk about spirituality, I'm not only talking about our Christian faith, recognizing, of course, that 90% of our uh, Pacific population um, is, is uh, rec or define themselves from a Christian perspective, but our indigenous spirituality also needs to be recognized. And that's very much part of sovereignty of uh, of self determination recognizing that when we are born our uh, our uh, pito pito our uh, umbilical cord is uh, when it drops off it's buried with a with a seedling or with a tree to grow reminding us that we are rooted in the land that we as pacific islanders you know um, uh, consider ourselves part of the land and part of the sea and that process that needs to we need to think about when people are uprooted and um, and 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 how that will how that will take place the impact the trauma that that will have on communities. The second is, of course, 
when we talk about receiving countries. Um, the case of Rambi, for example, the decisions were made really without the consultation of the Vanua of Rambi and how they feel about that. And so while the, our, our Banaban sisters and brothers were relocated and placed in this, on this island, the fishing grounds, the traditional fishing grounds still belong to the indigenous people, the Ngolingoli. So there is a, a challenge that is faced there. How do we, um, again, to use a, perhaps a Christian uh, uh, illustration here, how do we ensure that this journey, if it has to happen, is not one of exile, where people find themselves alienated and find themselves strangers, uh, crying to sing the Lord's song in a strange land, but to see it as exodus, where there is hope, there is possibility, and the, the possibility of, of flourishing in a new land with their culture, with their spirituality, with their identity. And this is, of course, part of the issue when we talk about sovereignty, because the other major issue is for the proponents of, uh, of, uh, of relocation or migration. We have to ask, what is the intention of some of our bigger island countries? Uh, and by bigger island countries, I refer, of course, to um, uh, those of you in uh, the land now called Australia. And we have heard of uh, um, policy uh, think tanks um, talking about offering um, work permits, talking about offering citizenship and uh, residency in return for sovereignty. Um, so these are some of the considerations that we, we really need to think about, about in terms of our advocacy, in terms of our pastoral care for our communities, and some of the very practical things that we need to look at. Um, and this is really where we as the church are trying to engage in, Naka. Reverend James, thank you so much. You've raised some fantastic questions which uh, speak to the heart of all advocates. Uh, we all share those same concerns. We hope that you will uh, talk a bit more on this um, a little bit later in our session. But for now, I'm going to hand over to Tate to take us through the next part of the forum. Thank you, Reverend. Yeah, th thank you again to all our speakers um, for their input and for their initial presentations. Um, this is the part now where we go into the, our, our Q&A session. So um, I think as Stella had mentioned, and I, I think it was TK who had mentioned earlier that um, uh, some of our questions, the first three questions we'll be asking are from our first forum. And then after that, we will take questions from the floor. Um, so to begin the night, I will begin with our first question is for Mina. Um, sorry, I'm just gonna, can I borrow your paper there? Okay, no worries, that's good. Yeah. Okay, so Mina, your first question for tonight it's, is, and I apologize, can, sorry, can I just get the question a little bit higher? Just a little bit low to apparently combine the camera, sorry. There we go, a little bit low, okay. So the common theory of state of sovereignty currently in use internationally is based on the Western tradition of the nation state. Do we need a new theory of state sovereignty that includes ideas from indigenous sovereignties, including ancient knowledge systems and relationships between humans and their natural environment? Which I think goes back to the, your, your initial presentation. And, and if you could answer that for us. Well, thank you so much. Um, yes, uh, indeed. But the problem that we are facing currently is the, the fact that um, more or, or less things are being determined by the powerful nations. So it depends on how do we um, handle the, the issue of sovereignty with, um, with close consultations with those who dominate the discussion. And, it, and I think it's about time that we sh they, they should come to our agenda. It's about time that they, they should allow us to speak on our own behalf. We don't need any more theories in terms of um, look around us, look at the uh, cases that um, uh, Reverend Bakwan raised in the issue of West Papua and so forth. And I think it's, it's, it's that colonial time is over. We, we should not continue to accept their logics. I think that that, that, that time is over. We, 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 if they want to cooperate with us, they need to come to our agenda. 
So in order for us to raise those sovereignty issues or sovereign rights, it, it's, it's about time that we should um, speak loudly of who we are as specific people and our indigenous wisdom that our communities were able to operate way before the influence of Palangi, way before Christianity, way before the colonization process. We have our own communities, we have our own processes, we have our own traditional wisdom that operates who we are as people and our community. So I think and, and then there is no harm in returning to those sovereign rights and, and concepts and principles. So I think we should start talking about it, telling our children, and also find what is the best way to, to, to cooperate with the, the bigger nations and those who continue to, uh, to have the power on us. So to just just to, just to continue just real quickly with your, your point there. So, like I guess yeah, what like I, what you, what you say is so true, and I think that's something that we all agree on. So how would you um, suggest in terms of, I guess for uh, uh, what we'd like to know is here in Australia, you know, well, what are ways that we can enforce this? Because obviously that 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 we all agree there there needs to be change in that arena. So do, what would you suggest? I suppose. For, for our islanders, especially here in Australia, who, who are, you know, constantly surrounded with, with that, but want, want to make, help make that change. How, what, what are ways that you, you, would, you, would, you would suggest that we can make that happen? I mean, what, what you're doing right now is one way. It's one of the ways of the many ways that you guys can do, but continue to advocate in different kinds of platforms, especially, you know, it's a, it, it's a political issue. So there, there, there needs to be a political will in order to change all this kind of system. But in order to, to, to change this kind of system, we need to, to make noise. We need to, to, to raise our voice. And this kind of platforms, and also seek other platforms as a way of advocating the issue of sovereignty and sovereign rights, I think it is very important. So mm -hmm. I, 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 I applaud what you guys are doing, especially this kind of platform. Thank you. Yeah. So dialogue will be is a mm. great way to begin. And yeah, okay. for sure. Thank you. Yeah. Good one. Thank you so much, um, Mina, for that. Um, our next question coming to you from the panel is going to be addressed to you, Katarina. So Katarina, the question is, given the lack of international law to protect state sovereignty, if a nation's territory becomes unlivable, how can Pacific Islanders and their nationality be protected if they are forced to leave their islands entirely because of climate change? Are there steps that should be taken urgently to establish new international law that protects them? What steps can you think of, Katerina? Um. International law is not my area of expertise, but I think one of the answers would be um, actually relevant to your first question that was put to Mina and his response about redefining um, what counts. What counts as a state? What counts as land, for example, and where it is? So, for example, one of the ways in which um, uh, when the mining company came to Barnaba, the way they got around definitions of land was by assuming that the surface of land was what could be parceled out for leasing, but anything underneath the surface was to be treated differently. For Pacific people, we don't treat the surface and below differently, right? Land is land and land isn't just what is above water. Land is everything. In Banaban cosmology, land comes from the sky. Land is a rock in the sky that falls to the earth and then the Banabans emerge out of the rock. So step one is redefining the sense of what territory is and how, how you can bring Pacific Islanders sense of the cosmological, epistemological, social, cultural, and spiritual de definitions of land 
into the equation. So if we redefine land according to our own cosmologies, you can't discount that just because the water rises a little bit higher. So all notions about territory, what counts as territory, um, discounting the ocean with respect to land. It, for Pacific people, when you say land, you're not just talking... I'm so sorry. About that. We're not just talking about soil. We're talking about the whole ecological environmental system. Hello. Hello there. <laughs> I'm really sorry about that. But I guess what I'm trying to say is if we start redefining what territory is, what land is, and what, where the boundaries are, then we're challenging those dominant colonial, imperial, international definitions of what counts as territory. So all of these suggestions that are coming out from international Mommy, relations Mommy? professors, sweetie, just Mommy, hold on a second. Mommy, can I have a candy yes, lollipop you may. from, from you my may. basket? Go. Um, all of these, all of these suggestions that are coming from IR professors, even from Kevin Rudd, suggesting that in exchange for migration, how about Australia take over the sovereignty of Pacific countries? This is not going to work in terms of our definition of land and the environment, because ocean, land, sea, sky, flora, fauna are one system. So when we say land, we're not taking them apart and, and having different categories and different definitions. So what Mina was saying about redefining things for ourselves using our own epistemologies is really, really important when it comes to challenging some of that, those international uh, definitions, laws and norms. Mm -hmm. And I, I apologize for the interruption, but I wasn't. No, no, no. <laughs> No problem at all, <laughs> Katerina. Um, thank you so yeah. much for you know, your comments in relation to that. Mm. Um, it serves to reinforce what Mina has been telling us. You know, many of the things that we feel in our hearts and we want to uh, broadcast to the world, we constantly are looking for opportunities and we just have to keep on going until the actual actions reveal themselves. So thank you so much, Katerina. Thank yeah, you. I, I, and I just want to just uh, say mm. quickly, because I think I remember from the first forum too, um, uh, Catherine Jetno Pigeoner mentioned the, the sort of the same point, the, the concept that there was a disconnect, you know, yes. whether it's, it's, we understand how we work, we understand how the Pacific people work. And I guess now our challenge is making the West, yeah, the countries with money value all this rather than just prioritize the, the the dollar bills and and you know working along uh, I think along those avenues of what different you know what defines sovereignty and all this kind of stuff. But yeah, for sure, but there's mm -hmm. a lot more. It does also and, require us to challenge some of the science as well. I want to say because yeah. science kind of def also defines what territory is and how people interpret the impact of climate change on the environment in terms of the rising sea levels. So it's not just a legal issue, but it is a dialogue between indigenous traditions and science as well. Absolutely. That's true. Very true. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so, oh, yeah, I'll, I'll move on to our, our third uh, question for the evening. Um, okay, so we've got number, question number three there. Mm. Okay, there was a bit of, uh, this is for you, Reverend James Bagwan. So the question for you is, there was a bit of publicity recently for a policy brief issued by two respected Australian research institutions, highlighting the impact of climate change and urging the Australian government to consider opening the way for large scale migration from the Pacific Island countries to Australia. What, in your opinion, and from your experience with the people in local communities in the Pacific think about this idea? We don't think much of it. I'll be honest. Uh, no, let's 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 be let's be let's be real realistic here. Um, a number of you are, are already uh, working hard to address the issue of care for our um, seasonal workers um, and those who come uh, to Australia on the uh, Pacific Labour Mobility Scheme. We know the challenges that are faced by a small group. Um, or, or by these groups when they come from our various uh, Pacific Island countries. Um, we already know that there is a, uh, you know, whenever I hear the word uh, uh, 
specific labor, I go back to, my mind goes back to uh, the blackbirding. My mind goes back to my, uh, my ancestors who were brought to Fiji as indentured laborers from India and the lack of dignity that they experience, the challenges that they face. And, you know, you get people who have dignity, sovereignty, identity, who have, um, even in a struggle of their life in, in their island countries, they have an affirmation of life in abundance and they're made to go and pick fruit. You know, um, the dignity in that. And I'm not saying that that's not honest work, but I'm saying that they cannot just look at the Pacific Island as a labor force. Um, this is not what we mean by the Vuvale, the family of the Pacific that uh, Australia claims to, uh, the Australian government claims to be, to be a part of it. And that's why I mentioned earlier also that these same uh, institutions are saying, we'll do that if you give us access to your exclusive economic zone. This is again the issue of sovereignty. Um, and right now there are major discussions going on and our, um, our friends at the um, Pacific Islands Forum and other, other organizations, um, our, our, some, a number of our Pacific Island leaders um, are pushing the issue of fixed international borders um, to protect the exclusive economic zones of our Pacific Island countries. So that mm -hmm. if the sea level continues to rise, those uh, land markers that are used to determine um, uh, the exclusive economic zones and the sovereignty, air, sovereign air territory of a country um, doesn't disappear. Um, so yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm quite concerned because that still does not address the issue of climate change. Yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it's saying, okay, look, well, we can't do much but you guys can, can come and stay with us and, and work in our countries. But we need you to stop uh, investing in fossil fuel. We need you to cut your emissions. It's not, uh, it's, you know, you, you can't um, just, um, it's just repeating what, what has been done in the past. And I don't think that's fair at all. Yeah, that, well, that's very true. Yeah, true. And then I think um, Anote Tong said in our, during our first forum yes. as well how, yeah, like even if we do come over, that, doesn't, that, that does not solve our issue because we still want to go back to our home islands, you know? So, yeah, I think that's a, that's a very good point. Thank you, Reverend. Mm. Thank you very much, Reverend, um, and all our um, speakers. It um, looks like we now reached the point where we're going to be crossing over to the questions that are coming to us from our audience today. Um, the questions you have been um, talking to, uh, honourable speakers, has been from the first forum. So the second uh, questions that are coming from our audience today, the first one is being directed to you, Reverend James, um, from one of our uh, participants tonight. They've posed the question asking, Speaking of women needing security when it comes to them trying to earn their livelihood by going fishing, and if people are relocated, then the safety of women is paramount to the church. But the church till date has not allowed women to be treated equally within the church system. How can I know for sure that women will be protected in the future? How can I know for sure that this is not a mere form of tokenism from the church's end to make women feel safer or accounted for? Now, this came as a random question from an unidentified participant. So I'm sure, um, Reverend, you're more than capable of answering this question that's come out of the blue. Now, these, um, this is a very important question. Um, and uh, it is uh, one that uh, more often uh, than not, I am called to, to respond to. And I will be very honest, for generations, the churches of the Pacific have been part of the patriarchal problem that has perpetu uh, perpetrated and perpetuated uh, violence against women in all its forms, whether it's physical, sexual, or structural. And um, 
you know, this is one of the challenges when we're talking about the issue of sovereignty, the decolonization of the theologies that were passed down to our, um, to our people uh, wrapped in Christianity. And, you know, this is something that, that we have been working um, in the Pacific Conference of Churches quite hard on, um, using what we call gender equality theology which is a uh, unpacking of those uh, biblical texts that are used to uh, oppress and suppress women um, structurally and um, in terms of uh, the issue of gender equality. And so, you know, we now have uh, church leaders calling violence against women and girls a sin. Uh, we now have leaders being willing to stand up at the pulpit and talk about it. We still have an issue when it comes to the ordination of women. We still have an issue where it comes to women in leadership in the church. And um, bringing this down to the grass or to the community level to, to be able to share these messages down to our congregations. But when we start to unpack this from a biblical perspective, we start to see that one of the other challenges that we face, and we, we have to be quite careful when we talk about indigenous knowledge or in our culture and our tradition, that while we celebrate our knowledge and indigenous knowledge and wisdom, we have to also be mindful of those uh, traditional uh, practices which are, do not uphold these sorts of values, such as equality, um, and um, can sometimes actually be used to to suppress um, our um, our women and our and our girls and, and, and our children as well. And so it's important that when we do this work, um, this gender-based uh, equality work that we do, or gender-based uh, gender equality theology work that we do, we start to unpack it and they, we remove the, the so-called biblical excuses that people like to give. Um, and then say, now, if it's not the Bible, what is it that is causing you to do, treat women this way? Is it your patriarchal prejudice? Is it uh, uh, a misinterpreted or uh, uh, misformed uh, uh, aspect of our traditional indigenous culture or which uh, takes uh, a practice that actually is meant to up uphold women and celebrate and recognize their power and their strength and it's flipped around the other way? And we need to name it for what it is. Um, that's that's from the the issue of 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 um, you know the issue of gender equality and, and gender based violence. But at the same time, on a very practical aspect, we recognise that women are at the forefront of all of these issues when we talk about climate change. It's it's our it's our women that are expected in our cultures to make sure that there's enough food for people to eat, right, for the family when there's uh, nothing available because the crops are not growing because of salt water inundation, when there's not enough fresh water because of droughts, um, when the community has been destroyed because of extreme weather patterns. The, the whole, we all place the pressure on the women because they seem to be the ones who, who need to look after the household. And so we need to address this holistically from the issue of religion or faith and from the issue of the perspective of culture, because those are our languages in the Pacific. Thank you. Thank you, Reverend James. Um, go on, Pat. Yeah. 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 Thank you, Reverend. So um, we have our next question. And who is this question targeted to? Anyone It'll specific? Look, yeah. Okay. So if anybody would like to uh, comment on this question, it's, it's, it's just a general one. So in the context of climate displacement and sovereignty, one of the common rhetorics within communities, especially those of Christian faith, is that climate change is a God-influenced phenomena and that it should be accepted as it is. How are the panelists addressing these views, perceptions within our communities? So maybe I'll get, um, I'll ask Katerina if she can uh, maybe uh, uh, comment on that one first. Sure. Um, it was really interesting uh, to hear the Reverend talk earlier about um, exodus and exile and yes. um, interpreting what has happened to a people because of colonialism and imperialism 
through a biblical lens. So in my research, um, I came across a lot of these metaphors that were used uh, from the Bible in order to interpret what was happening to the Barnabans with the loss of their land, loss of sovereignty, and so on. So as you say, uh, or as the um, questioner said, um, when any major phenomenon happens, when anything happens, uh, it is now like automatic for Pacific people to try to interpret it through this biblical uh, or theological lens, but often coming on down on a non-progressive <laughs> interpretation of things, a, a more fatalistic sense of things. And um, fatalism, I think, is very much at odds with a sense of empowerment and agency and resilience and resistance, which is really what needs to be our focus and what I feel um, the wonderful work of the Pacific Conference of Churches is doing in terms of challenging some of these ideas and these theological interpretations from a much more grounded, uh, progressive and empowering perspective on what's happening. So rather than thinking, oh, we can't do anything about it. This is just like what happened in the Bible. We should actually be interpreting those things in a very different way. Unfortunately, with the kinds of education systems that we've had in the Pacific, we often don't turn in the first instance to our own interpretations grounded in our own cultural knowledges. This is the case across the disciplines and as people would, were talking, I was thinking about how a field like Pacific Studies, for example, is something that all of us from the Pacific should be doing. We should be the Pacific experts in Pacific Studies, but we're often not. In Australia, but the Pacific Studies space is often dominated by non-Pacific Islander experts. So of course we question everything and try to find interpretations from lenses that are not our own, because our education systems don't empower us to interpret things from our own cultural uh, and cus uh, customary perspectives. In the case of the Banabans, we've lost some of this because of the displacement to Fiji. Many elders died within the first three months of landing on Rambi Island in Fiji, and they took that knowledge with them when they passed away. So Barnabans have had to reconstruct things in all kinds of ways, bringing different kinds of knowledges together. And still today, many of us are not empowered to think from a Barnaban or a Pacific perspective. If all of us were empowered to value, for example, Pacific studies as much as we value law and business and accounting and all the things that our parents would prefer us to study, then we would also value the history and the knowledge which comes with studying the Pacific. So at the moment, I think education is one of those areas where we need to look at critically. If people are only interpreting through the Bible or through a capitalistic lens from this perspective of infinite economic growth from <laughs> the sun and the moon and the stars, which will not help the planet in any way, shape or form, then we have a problem because we are not interpreting things from the sustainable, grounded, resilient perspectives that have actually uh, kept us in good stead for thousands of years in the Pacific. There's a disconnect in terms of what kind of knowledge is actually valued. So you go to the Bible or you go to the textbook or you go to some other source, which is not a Pacific source. Well, um, if you don't mind me asking Reverend uh, James Bagwan if you if you would like to comment on that. And mine. And yeah. Okay, I'll I'll leave Miner to talk about the rainbow theology, <laughs> um, because uh, they have worked very hard in Tuvalu to address the issue of uh, what we call the rainbow theology. So I'll leave that to them. I just want to pick up on uh, what uh, Katarina has been saying. And um, you know, I agree. You know, absolutely. This is the, this is the issue when we talk about uh, the ongoing work of decolonization. When we talk about sovereignty, this is about this this issue of education. We are still, uh, you know, we learn we learn Western history first, and then we learn Pacific history. Uh, and when we learn our own uh, the history of our our people or our countries, our islands. We learn about the Western 
discovery of of our of our place we don't learn about the the wonderful voyaging that was done you know the seafaring that was done where where the ocean is the highway of the pacific people traveling backwards and forwards i mean i went to narikoso last week and back on a traditional sailing canoe you know oh, wow. um, and uh, and um, but when we so we 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 fall back to to what what we have that connects with our identity and in this context it is the um, you know the christian uh, spiritual worldview the context of exodus and exile also the major movers that is uh, it is a response to empire right in egypt it was the exploitative extractive industries of the egyptian empire which is the same thing that we are facing today forced relocation again for exploitation and extraction by the babylonians which is the same thing we are facing today and so when we we don't have access to our indigenous history because that has been squashed um or those who transmit this history are no longer there to do so um or the um the the memory has 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 been forgotten then we turn to what is available and so we're working very hard to change the narratives the biblical narratives to to address these things and 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 use these things to to address empire extraction exploitation naka naka thank you mina mina if you want to carry on with the tell us more about the theory theology uh thank you so much yes um it is an issue it is an issue back home not just in Tuvalu, but majority of the places in the Pacific that cling so much on the um, traditional reading of the Bible and the understanding of the non-narrative. In 2011, we um, actually uh, did a NOAA and climate change workshop trying to, to gather all the uh, religious groups in Tuvalu in order for us to reread the, um, the, the NOAA narrative in the context of Tuvalu and climate change. But what is uh, very interesting that came out of the uh, discussion is the fact that majority of our elders continue to, to say, nah, despite the fact that we are seeing all these changes, they still continue to, to remain faithful to their colonial uh, uh, London missionaries who came with the, with the Bible as an absolute text, leaving no other rooms for other interpretation of the text. So that's, that's as uh, Catalina said, yeah, we need to reinterpret the text according to, to our values, to our value systems, to, to our uh, culture, nature, and so forth. So they hold strong to the fact that, you know, God will never send any more flood to destroy humanity. But what we try to, to, to tell them, that we need to uh, have this materialistic reading of the Bible, try to understand the, um, the context where the story was written, and how we interpret the text according to, to, to our perception of the time. But in fact, we have this very um, interesting movement in Tuvalu, the evangelical movement or the new religious groups in, in, in Tuvalu and so, and, and so is the other Pacific Islands. You know, they, they look at climate change, look at rising sea level as something that will um, accelerate the coming back of Christ, the parousia. So they, they continue to look at, oh, that, it's good that the, you know, the sea is rising, our lands are being destroyed, destroyed by, by the water, and therefore, you know, Christ is coming back soon. But I think they don't have any social ethics. We, we, we need to, to do something. This is nothing to do with God. Climate change, I totally argue that this is nothing to do with God. And therefore, it, it's a good news that it's nothing to do with God. It's something that was uh, started by human greed, and the race for civilization. So it's something that we can do, we can work on it. If it's something to do with God, then it's beyond our capacity to, to negotiate with God. And we must also change the narrative. This Christian imperialistic understanding of the narrative that were brought in by the London Missionary Society and other missionary agencies to the Pacific, you know, with this common phrase, God is good all the time. I think sometimes we have to stop and rethink and say God is sometimes is not so good. How can we say God is good all the time, and yet our island, we are losing our islands to the sea? How can we continue to say that God is good all the time, and the people in, uh, 
in West Papua are being killed. And yet we, the five out, the Taratala, the pastors, continue to preach, yeah, God is a loving God. And yet we, we are seeing people are being killed. I think sometimes God is not really that good. It's not the God that I'm talking about, the Christian God or that, that kind of God. What I'm talking about, the God here that I'm referring to is the system. The system that was brought in, you know, injected into our mind as the dominant system, dominate system in our, in our, in our mind. So everything that we see is either market ideologies and the continuation to the pursuit for, for happiness, which is only in the sense of money. But I think we should, should go back to our roots. Just before I close off with, with this question, I think there's another good point that needs to be raised here. You know, while you guys are here in Australia, you make Australia as your home. I think it's about time that you should make uh, um, a good connection with the indigenous people of Australia and how best you guys can work together, even the people in, in New Zealand, you know, with the indigenous people of New Zealand. Because I think for two times, the, people, the, the government of Fiji offered to value land. Our former prime minister continued to say, no, we should not take the offer. And one, one of the, uh, the, the elements that, that, that our former prime minister continued to say, no, is the fact that will us be welcomed by the receiving country with the, by the indigenous people of Fiji, or this is just done in that political level. You know, we, we need to hear the, the voices of the, uh, to see whether this is a genuine offer. It's not a political offer. It should be, it should come from the people that owns the land, you know, from the indigenous people. So we need to make friends with the indigenous people of Australia. And as the Reverend Buck once said, we, we, we need to, to, to hold that as a, as a last option, as a, a reserve card of our negotiation uh, process, that um, migration should be the last resort. Plan B should be an ongoing discussion at the moment because it's an issue, it's a legal issue. It's tra it's tra trans boundaries, you know, we're crossing borders and it's, you, we, we cannot do that overnight. It requires a lot of time to, to negotiate. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maina. All the way with you, you know, connecting with our first people of Australia. Uh, the Pacific Islands Council has been uh, working tirelessly at making sure that we do connect, as has Friends of the Earth Australia Climate Frontlines, because of uh, connections to the Torres Strait Islands and also some of the other big Aboriginal communities around the country where they are fighting battles alongside us as well in relation to climate change. It's an ongoing piece of work, but we will persevere as we all do, um, because as you have all said, the land, the sky, the sea, the rivers, all of nature is part of us as we are part of it. So we come to our next question now. Do we have another question that has come from our chat box? Yes. Um, this time the question has come from Emma Davis. It's a question Imelda. to Imelda Davis. Sorry, Imelda. Mm -hmm. um, it's a question to the entire uh, panel. Would you agree that a specific policy developed from a specific diaspora perspective to be presented to dominant powers would perhaps be successful? Anybody want to go for that one? Um, is it specific to the Australian Pacific diaspora or all? I think it is. Um, Imelda has um, intentionally asked for it to be the Australian Pacific diaspora oh, because okay. of our location here in Australia. Would you, would you like to start the start by uh, trying to give it a, even that question a go? Um, yeah. that in? Um, sure. Um, could you just read the first part again, please? <laughs> yeah. 
those periods. Would, would you agree that a specific policy developed from a Pacific diaspora perspective to be presented to dominant powers could be successful? Okay. Um, this is something that I've always found very interesting in the Australian context because I've um, noticed that different Pacific diasporic populations have quite different experiences in those diasporas. So there's a big Pacific diaspora to the United States. Uh, uh, we all know a very large diaspora, particularly a Polynesian diaspora to uh, New Zealand. And there is also a growing Pacific diaspora in Australia, as well as uh, the descendants of South Sea Islanders and people who have been here for generations because of the Pacific slave trade. It does um, occur to me that the Pacific diaspora in Australia is often not um, engaged and taken as seriously as some of the other diasporas in the countries that I just mentioned. And it's this extraordinary um, it's kind of blind spot, particularly from a federal perspective, an Australian federal perspective, where when they're talking about the Pacific, they are constantly thinking about the Pacific out there in the islands from a foreign policy perspective. And they rarely look to the Pacific here in Australia, in, in urban, in regional, you know, all the diverse places that Pacific peoples live and consider them as an important resource for thinking about how to address some of the, the policies and the issues and challenges that are relevant to the Pacific in the islands. So um, I think this is a problem in Australia where um, the federal government, I think the state governments maybe do a slightly better job and there's a better uh, visibility and representation of Pacific peoples at the state level through councils like the ones involved in putting this excellent forum together. I know it's there in New South Wales. I know people in Victoria are organized, but that's treated as a separate and different space compared with the foreign policy aid and development focus of the federal government. So in order to address many of the issues that both Reverend Bhagwan and Mina um, have raised, the these countries like Australia, the United States and New Zealand already does this. They really need to think about the Pacific in, in terms of the whole spectrum of Pacific people, those in the islands, those who uh, migrate between islands, those who migrate to cent uh, centers overseas and consider that whole space to be the Pacific, Oceania. When we travel and we move and we relocate, we take our lands literally with us as part of our bodies into those new spaces. And this is where it can get quite um, challenging and difficult because many of the spaces that we move to, as Mina has correctly pointed out, are indigenous to other people. These are other people's indigenous lands. So building those relations relationships with the people of the lands where we move to is absolutely critical. We can't, we don't just move anyhow nga like that. We actually have to think about where we're going, who these places belong to and build uh, supportive uh, relations with those people. So I completely agree with Imelda that th there is still this space, especially policy wise, for there to be a Pacific diaspora perspective in Australia on many of the major issues that Pacific scholars, Pacific policymakers, and particularly federal government are constantly thinking about. So they have all of these Senate inquiries about the Pacific, and you usually see them trot out a whole range of Balangi experts on the Pacific. And it's like, hello, what about all the Pacific people here already? who have many thoughts and care a lot about these issues. But it is a complex space where we do have to think through those issues of solidarity and support for the people of the lands that we have moved to, as well as talking across our own Polynesian, Micronesian, Melanesian borders and boundaries, of which 
there are plenty to also work through and the South Sea Islanders and their communities and Torres Strait Islanders. So there are many different kinds of spaces that need to be healed, dialogue that needs to be had in order to even form a perspective that could make a positive difference in the policy or decision-making space. Thank you, Katerina. If I may jump in at this point, because I am conscious of the time, I would just like to reassure you that uh, our president of the Pacific Islands Council of Queensland, we have taken this conversation to the Department of Foreign Affairs and every possible government agency that could possibly listen and to understand that we are not just one country in the Pacific Ocean. We are several different sovereign nations, 22 in all. And that when the Pacific Islands Council speaks, it doesn't speak for just one of those nations, but for all of those nations. And it is through the president's efforts that we have now linked up with other Pacifica communities around the country. We are also pushing for the federal government to have a council of our Pacifica people to be an advisory group to the government, because we are aware that despite our long, long relationship with Australia, Pacific Islanders are still pretty much ignored. Our voice is still absent, absent in the public space because we are regarded as just another group of people who actually sort of like belong here, but they don't understand that we actually come from many, many diverse cultures. So having said that, I'm going to pose a final question before we uh, go to uh, the closing. The final question for you all, and I'm sorry, I have to ask you to be very brief in response. You have all had some experience of engaging with academic programs and projects about climate change, particularly with relation to our Pacific. What do you see as the role of academia in the climate change space? Minor, would you like to, you know, have a go at that one? Because you're writing your thesis. You're steep now deep in academia. Thank you. Um, yes, I think it, it is very important, of course. But I think there is a missing strand in the academic writing on climate change. There are two things that I wish to, um, to, to address. First is the, the moral side of the, the issue of climate change and relocation and so forth. And secondly, which should be the first, is the religious aspect of the, uh, of the issue. Say for example, uh, during uh, COP25 last year in Madrid, um, I organized an event in Madrid and I had the chance to invite the Reverend Bakwan uh, Arnaud de Tong and NLA on to discuss the issue of Am I Not Your Neighbor on the uh, Gospel of Luke, chapter 10. Taking, taking that, 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 that religious trend into the UN process and processes, it is very important. So that's how I see that the, the academic side, the, you know, that's missing strand in, in the, the academic type of writing that we are doing trying to weave in this religious language, because it does not only confine to Christianity, but it's trans boundaries. You know, it, it also hits our Muslim brothers and other religions as well. It, they talk about neighbor. It's the issue of neighbor. Am I not your neighbor? So that, that issue was um, clearly discussed in Madrid last year during the um, conference of the party under the UNFCCC. And we had the chance to, 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 to broadcast it live. And Scott Morris then responded from the parliament the following day to that, same, to that particular event. That's why I see religious language and religious strand needs to be incorporated into our academic writings. 
you know, we are all from the Pacific, and that, that particular in religious language, flavor, once you put it into that, you know, it, it really hits the hearts of those Mos our Muslim brothers and sisters, you know, from those oil countries. Am I not your neighbor? The question that was raised by the lawyer to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? So mm -hmm. it, it is no longer an issue of uh, proximity. It's an issue of how we deal with those who are impacted by our actions. So sure. that's one point that I wish to raise and, and to all Pacific brothers and friends who are listening. I think we should incorporate that religious strand into our, uh, our academic writings because it will easily um, transform the hearts of those who listen because they, they come from re different religious groups, traditions, but of course, when it comes to the issue of neighbor, it's there in their writings as well. It's not just in the Bible. It's everywhere. Thank you. Thank you, Mina. I think that um, we're pretty close to the end now. Um, Maybe I think we have time for one more question yeah. to comment before oh, we have yeah. so, Rever Reverend James and Katerina, any final comments in relation to that question? Yeah, thank you to uh, Mina for, for making that point. Um, I'll just very briefly say that one of my concerns when it comes to the issue of academia um, and the issue of research is where is this research going and who makes use of it? Because our people are telling their stories in the hope that people would listen and do something. And if it, all it does is end up uh, in a journal somewhere for somebody to get the required number of publications to get a professorship or something, and that's a big shame on academia. So for me, at PCC, we are inundated with requests from, from researchers on a regular basis. And most times we, we will tell the stories or we'll connect people because we need the story to be told. And we need those uh, academic writings sometimes to back up what we are talking about on the ground or from a spiritual perspective. But I'm becoming very cautious of the fact or conscious of the fact that this is um, also the flavor of the month for many writers, yeah. or so I say many researchers. And we need to make sure that um, we hold everyone accountable for, um, for their work. Naka. Can I just agree 1,000 million trillion percent with <laughs> Reverend James Bakwan as an academic surrounded by all the people following the flavor of the month <laughs> and publishing like you wouldn't believe. One of the questions that I've started to ask and I ask my PhD students to also ask this question is, whose mana is grown by that research project? Who has the funds? Who is publishing? Whose name is on the publication? And who are they citing? Because if Pacific people are the raw data, the informants, but are not the authors, are not the co-authors, and are not cited in the bibliography and the reference section as the experts, then this is not about our mana, it's about their mana. And that's really, really important. We have to be the experts on this story, on this narrative, on fighting for our lives with respect to climate change. I'm so excited that people like Mina are doing their PhDs and we need all the people to come and do their PhDs and their masters and their studies. It's not to say that academia is the authoritative source of knowledge by any means because science has its problems as well. But there is uh, a flavor of the month problem and issue and challenge and there's a problem in terms of who gets the glory around climate change related research so even though it's really important in terms of knowledge production in terms of getting like uh, the reverend said those narratives and those stories out there and that evidence being important for pacific people we can make critical decisions and critical choices about who to work with how we work with them always being attentive to issues of power and justice, especially issues of structural power, which is 
a huge problem in academia at the moment and we need a lot more Pacific people across all the dis disciplines working in this space. So it's been a real honor and privilege for me to hear my two colleagues here talking on these issues because I think you are both powerful voices that are absolutely spot on on these issues. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Katarina. Thank you, Mina. Thank you, Reverend James, for your time this evening. Unfortunately, we are now out of time. Um, so thank you, thank you, thank you, Tanikyu. I will now ask Tate to final, uh, give her final words to close us off before we call Taukie in to do the final, final part of this session. Thank you, guys. You are so inspiring. Thank yeah. you. I just want to say and thank you so much, I think, for this whole conversation. There's a few times where we had goosebumps, like, yeah, yes. yes, for real. But no, thank you so much for your time to our speakers, to Reverend James, Reverend James Bagwan, to Maina Kalia, to Katarina Tiaiwa. Thank you so much for being with us and contributing to tonight's conversation. And we really look forward to hopefully connecting again with you all in the future. To our viewers as well, from our team, to your guy, to you all out there, thank you for, for joining us this evening. All right, now that we have come to the end of our show today, thank, I would like to thank Tate and uh, Sela for their great facilitation for tonight's um, event. Now in closing, I would like to again thank all our panelists this evening, Reverend uh, James Bagwan, uh, Professor Katerina uh, Tewa, and soon probably our new professor or Dr. Maina Talia. Yes. Um, look, this Talanoa tonight session was exactly what we needed. I also would like to thank everyone who has tuned in today, tonight. Like the first forum, this forum will be made available to you all via the Friends of the Earth um, website and also the PICT website. Now, the, um, I would like to thank the organizing team. And on behalf of the organizing team as well, I would like to acknowledge and thank first our event support, Ishara Shihama, Sarah Smile, Smiley, and Joel uh, Lindsay from UNAA. Also, I would like to thank our tech support, Terry. And also, I would like to, to thank the people who provided this venue, the uh, YMCA Acacia Rich. And last but not least, I would like to thank you all who have tuned in tonight to tonight's event. There has been a lot of takeaways from tonight's event, ranging from migration, not a solution, absence of foreign domination, going back to indigenous knowledge and to understand what sovereignty means to us as Pacific Islanders. About time that the international community accept and engage with indigenous communities to establish international agreement. You know? There are lots of missing strands, religious, moral issues that are needed to be included in the academic um, sphere. Where are the indigenous um, stories? These, these are all the questions that are missing and that are need to be addressed, not by us, but by the international community and by government. I hope that you have learned a lot from tonight's event and that tonight will provide a, a richer platform for our face-to-face, -face, upcoming face-to-face -face, um, uh, event, which we will hope will be in next year's, uh, sometime next year. Now, as always, as Pacific Islanders, we always finish our gatherings with a word of prayer. So I would like to invite 
um, Reverend James Bakwan, if he can finish and close our gathering tonight with a word of prayer. Thank you, Bakwan. Baka. Mendamasu, let us pray. Loving and embracing God, God of the land and the sea and the sky, God of all creation. As we conclude our Talano today, we thank you for open hearts and open minds. We thank you for the mana, the dina, the power and the truth that has been shared in questions and answers. We know, O oh Lord, that there is much work still to be done. We know that there are many times where we struggle in this work. So as we conclude and as we go our separate ways, we ask for your strength, for your courage to keep up this fight, to keep up this struggle. We pray for your children of the Pacific, those of the Moana, the Wasawasa, the Solwara, of the liquid continent spread across this blue Pacific, the people of the diaspora, all of whom are your Pacific children. Bless them. Bless those at the forefront of climate change. Bless those who are struggling with their future. And may they not lose sight of the hope that you give. In the words of your son, who came that we may have life and life in abundance. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you again and stay safe. Thank you. Good night all. Thank you. Good night, Sir Paul. Good night.